But up next, Mary with the ITV Evening News. But from me and everyone on the London team, bye-bye. Ramping up the pressure on Russia to abandon its assault on Ukraine. We are on the edge of a, of a precipice, but there is still time for President Putin to, to step back. Diplomacy intensifies as tensions escalate, with growing fears of an invasion within the next 48 hours. Well, here, talk of war pushes up petrol prices, tightening the squeeze on already cash-strapped families. This is BBC. Also tonight, the latest legal salvo in the Battle of the Wags, a potential setback for Colleen Rooney. And... Rap royalty and the real thing, a star-studded show at the Super Bowl. On TV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. Ukraine could be invaded by Russia within the next 48 hours, according to the Prime Minister. Boris Johnson urged the Kremlin to step back from what he called the precipice, warning a war in Eastern Europe would be disastrous. Russia denies any plans to launch an attack, accusing the West of spreading propaganda, and it insists it is still open to talks. Today, diplomatic efforts did continue, with NATO still hoping for a peaceful solution. But tonight, there were renewed calls for Britain to leave Ukraine after a COBRA meeting chaired by the Foreign Secretary. From Kiev, our global security editor, Rohit Kantri, reports. <laughs> New video released tonight by the Russian military. What the Kremlin says are normal exercises. But according to the UK, the US and others, this is part of the build-up to an invasion, which they say could come within days. The signs are, as you've heard from uh, President Biden, that uh, they're at least planning uh, for something that could take place as early as in uh, the next 48 hours. Uh, that is e extremely uh, concerning. President Putin met his foreign minister. At the Kremlin, across the long table and with the cameras rolling, he asked what most people were wondering, what chance now of a diplomatic solution? The response seemed to offer some hope. But then in Kiev, the Ukrainian president met with the German chancellor. He said, contrary to one of Russia's main demands, it still intends to join NATO. Punish Putin, not Ukraine. Punish Putin, not Ukraine. Not far from the presidential palace, we heard the voices of people taking to the streets to protest, for whom this is not just geopolitics, but real life. We will stay here. And my daughter, 11 years old, uh, my husband, we are in Kyiv because this is our country. Have you talked to your child about this? Yes, and she was crying because uh, she could imagine, like, um, uh, let's, let's not talk about this. OK. This is preparation for a scenario which seemed so distant only a few days ago. On the outskirts of Kiev, we saw firearms and ammunition being bought. The customers here don't represent everyone in Ukraine, far from it. But for them, the end of this week feels like a long way away. This gun saleswoman says today has been busy with people who aren't panicking, but who want to feel protected. Life does go on in Kiev. But warnings from Western countries about what might happen this week have not softened. Although you wouldn't always know it here. New claims from abroad say Putin plans to surround this city, isolating Ukrainian forces elsewhere to take the capital.
Rohit Katru, ITV News, Kiev. Well, Russian forces are now surrounding Ukraine on three sides. 130,000 troops, as well as tanks and heavy artillery, have gathered all along Ukraine's border. Of those, 30,000 are currently engaged in military drills in Belarus to the north. That's close to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. At least 20,000 Russian personnel are stationed close to two breakaway provinces in eastern Ukraine, where the Ukrainian military has been at war with Russian-backed separatists for eight years. Troops are still building up in the Crimea Peninsula, annexed, of course, by Russia in 2014. More than 30 ships from the Russian Black Sea Fleet started training exercises nearby over the weekend. In response to Russian manoeuvres, NATO allies have beefed up their support on the alliance's eastern flank. The UK, with allies like America, has sent troops to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania and Bulgaria. Okay, let's return to Rohit in Kiev and our, our political editor Robert Peston's in Downing Street tonight. And turning to Rohit, first of all, what is your assessment of this seemingly escalating crisis? Well, it's really difficult to assess, Mary, because every guess about what happens next is really a second guess, a second guess of a president who is unpredictable, who isn't thought to have shared his uh, intentions beyond his inner circle, a president who's make, made it clear that he feels Ukraine is unfinished business for him, but a president who's faced with massive costs if he does invade, financial uh, and human costs as well. What we do know and what we can say is that the nature of the the, the warnings, the intelligence that's been released by the UK, the US and others is, is unusually specific. This timetable which has been laid out for an invasion this week, perhaps coming uh, even on Wednesday. What we don't know is what impact that might have uh, on President Putin's actions, because the clear intention of the release of that information is to try to corner him into de-escalation. OK, Road Katru in Kiev, thank you. Well, let's turn to Robert in Downing Street, where the Prime Minister has been holding a call, we understand, with President Biden. Robert, does the government believe an invasion is now inevitable? So, look, three things. Uh, uh, one is, as you say, Boris Johnson behind me is still, as I understand it, talking to President Biden. We're expecting a readout any minute. Second, uh, you know, this is not... Uh, you know, some other countries' conflict, even putting to one side the fact there are British troops around Ukraine, uh, if there is a Russian invasion and then sanctions follow, we're going to see the oil price soaring from, what, about $95 to, uh, you know, maybe $150, according to our analysts, and the gas price is going to soar. It's going to make our cost of living crisis even worse. When you, on your specific question, um, look, ministers and security sources of mine are divided on the question of whether Putin is going to invade. Listen very carefully to all the briefings. You know, Rohit's just gone through them. What they've said is that the Russian president is in a position to invade at any moment, perhaps as soon as Wednesday. That is not the same by any stretch of the imagination that he, that, that, you know, that he is going to invade. Uh, many of the security sources I talk to say he's already achieved an enormous amount. He's shown a Europe divided. He's shown he's still a big player on the international stage. He's demonstrated to the Ukraine how dangerous it is for them, in his terms, were they to push for uh, NATO membership. And the really important thing is that he has not prepared the Russian people for what would be a very long, protracted and painful for them war. So I would say that the British government, in terms of whether it will happen, is divided, even though they are preparing for the worst. All right, Robert Peston in Downing Street, thank you. And uh, those rising tensions in Ukraine are already being felt back here at the petrol pumps. Russia is one of the world's biggest oil suppliers and fears of war are fueling record prices. On average, petrol now costs more than £1.48 a litre. And that is, of course, yet another squeeze on hard-pressed families already struggling with the cost of living crisis, as Sangeeta Lal reports. Spreading romance on Valentine's Day, usually this florist's most profitable job of the year. But it seems the moment's gone. The rise in fuel prices now meaning a delivery charge on orders for the first time here. I'm gutted because I was quite proud at the fact that I could deliver with no charge. 
And it's supposed to be a bump day. Everybody says it's a bump day, but the costs are really huge. It's because the average cost of a litre of unleaded is now £1.48. That means it costs nearly £82 to fill up a family car. A litre of diesel costs £1.52 and filling up a family car with that fuel now costs around £83. So why is this actually happening? Well, the price at pumps is largely driven by the wholesale price of energy. And with Russia being one of the world's biggest producers of oil, if the situation there deteriorates, the supply of oil could be disrupted, meaning prices have gone up. And that keeps the pressure on those global prices. People won't speculate and bring the prices down when there's global uncertainty. And global movement has pushed up prices too, with a rise in demand as the world emerges from the pandemic. That's 140 quid to fill that up now. And it used to be 95 before Christmas. You see the little bit at the end of the spreadsheet for you is just going down and down and down. I don't know when it's going to end. A question asked by businesses too. The answer, it seems, not any time soon. Sangi Talal, ITV News, Grantham. Now, the public inquiry into what's been described as the worst miscarriage of justice in recent British legal history. Over a 14-year period, sub-postmasters were wrongly prosecuted for fraud after a computer system detected shortfalls in branch accounts. Now, that later emerged that the Horizon software had errors leading to dozens of convictions being overturned. Neil Connery reports. They are the faces of some of those whose lives and livelihoods were ruined by the great post office scandal. Some of the 700 former sub-postmasters wrongly accused of theft, fraud and false accounting. All were innocent victims of a computer system flaw which had devastating consequences. Among them, Joe Hamilton, arriving at the start of this public inquiry into what happened. Wrongly charged with false accounting in 2005, the scars remain. My mum and dad, they were there all the time. They financially bailed me out. They let us use the house to, to repay post office. And um, they both died before my conviction was quashed. They knew I'd never stop fighting. Inside the inquiry, Baljit Sethi told how he was wrongly accused of false accounting and asked to pick up the missing £17,000. No amount of compensation can return us the 20 years of hell we have gone through. Only my wife and I know it, how we have struggled in these 20 years. We have worked so many hours for a petty amount of money. Counsel to the inquiry talked of the terrible toll. It's about people whose mental and physical health has been impacted, about people whose marriages and partnerships have deteriorated or failed about people who thought about taking their own lives and, in some cases, who took their own lives. Noel Thomas was jailed for nine months in 2006 for false accounting after 42 years of working for the post office. You know, it was a fall from grace. You know, you, you went from the top of the ladder right down to the bottom and it's taken a hell of a long time to get back to the top. The post office says it's doing all it can to address the human cost, but those who've suffered say its impact can't be rectified by compensation alone. Neil Connery, ITV News. Still to come the ITV News, the cervical cancer screening warning. And the teenager at the centre of a doping scandal who's been allowed to carry on competing in the Olympics. Those stories and more after this very short break. Welcome back. Now, a judge has ruled that Colleen Rooney cannot bring a claim against Rebecca Vardy's agent as part of their ongoing libel case. It is just the latest twist in the so-called Wagatha Christie legal battle, which started when Rooney accused Vardy of leaking stories about her. Chloe Keady has more. Believe it or not, Colleen Rooney and Rebecca Vardy used to be friends. For years now, they've been at the centre of a long-running feud, which reads more like the script of a soap opera. 
The latest plot twist involves a third woman, Rebecca Vardy's former agent, Caroline Watt. Rooney claims Watt misused her private information and worked in cahoots with Vardy to leak stories about her to the Sun newspaper. The wife of former England footballer Wayne Rooney was dubbed Wagatha Christie after she carried out a sting operation to find out who was leaking stories that she'd posted on her private Instagram page. The culprit, she said, was Rebecca Vardy, but Vardy has always denied it and is now suing her former friend for libel. Colleen Rooney wanted to bring a claim against Caroline Watt to be heard alongside the libel case, but the judge refused her application, saying it had been made too late and would delay the main trial by up to a year. That, she said, would be unfair on Rebecca Vardy. Colleen Rooney claims that messages from Vardy to Watt show that she planned to leak her private information. The judge ruled today that some of these messages should be disclosed. In response, Rooney's spokesperson said, Colleen and her lawyers look forward to seeing the results of further extensive searches ordered today by the judge of Mrs Vardy's WhatsApp messages with relevant parties. Instagram will also be formally asked to assist with disclosure of relevant Instagram data. Representatives for Rooney and Vardy are due back in court in April. It's believed their legal costs have already run into millions of pounds, dwarfing any damages likely to be awarded at the end of this case. Chloe Keady, ITV News. Now some famous faces are urging everyone eligible to book a cervical screening. In England, two people die of cervical cancer every day, but screenings can stop the disease before it even starts. And that's why a new campaign's been launched, targeting the 30% eligible who don't take up their appointment. Here's our health editor, Emily Morgan. At 27, cervical cancer couldn't have been further from Destiny's mind. But in June 2020, she was diagnosed with it. Her cervical screening had been repeatedly postponed because of lockdown, and it was a trip to A&E that finally gave her the news she feared most. It's been really life-changing for me. Um, the side effects from the treatment are going to be with me for the rest of my life. Um, I'm now going through the menopause at the age of 29. I'm now infertile, so I can't have any children. And the implications, both physically and mentally, are huge. How long does it take a cervical screen and what does it entail? The government's trying to answer these questions from celebrities to ensure fewer women suffer like destiny. It's launched a campaign to encourage more people to get a smear test, with a third of eligible people unscreened, a disproportionate number of whom are lesbian and bisexual. It's desperate to reach them. Around 40% of women are not turning up for their screen because they're too embarrassed to come along and discuss cervical screening or to have their smear. And this means that we literally have women who are dying from embarrassment. In fact, around two people a day die from cervical cancer. It is the second most common cancers among women under 35 in England. I was Miss International UK in 2018. One Love Island star backing the campaign wants to debunk misconceptions about screening. I don't know this is when you get screened, it's with the brush. You automatically think the worst that it is something dangerous or scary. But actually, you know, when you have these conversations with your medical physician, that is actually nowhere near as scary as, as it should, as you guys think it is. It's estimated cervical screening prevents 70% of deaths. Destiny is pleased her cancer didn't kill her, but knows if she'd had her smear test, it could have saved some of the trauma she lives with. Emily Morgan, ITV News. And the Duchess of Cornwall has tested positive for coronavirus just days after Prince Charles. Camilla had tested negative before she carried out engagements last Thursday, the day Prince Charles had a positive result. Buckingham Palace has refused to confirm if the Queen has it too. And that West is closing 32 of its branches as a growing number of customers move to online banking. The list includes Royal Bank of Scotland sites. Let's move on to the Winter Olympics now, where a rouse erupted after the Russian figure skater Camilla Valieva was given the green light to take part in tomorrow's competition. Now, last week it was announced the 15-year-old had failed a drugs test back in December, but she's now been controversially cleared to compete. From Beijing, our Asia correspondent Debbie Edward sent this report. Her composure has showed a maturity beyond her years, but the fact she is under 16 
is the reason why she will take part in the women's event tomorrow, despite still being under investigation for doping. The Court of Arbitration for Sport listed her status as a protected person as one of the reasons it ruled in her favour. In particular, the panel considered that preventing the athlete to compete at the Olympic Games would cause her irreparable harm in these circumstances. The decision topped news bulletins in Moscow. More important, it would seem, than the crisis in Ukraine. She is the golden girl of Russia, and her team claims she is clean and innocent. It was Balieva's performance which helped secure gold for the country in last week's team event. The Americans, who were beaten into second place, said today's ruling denied all athletes a level playing field. The International Olympic Committee has confirmed that the investigation into Valieva and her team will not be concluded before the end of the Beijing Games. It also announced it will not hold a medal ceremony if she finishes in the top three women this week. All eyes will be on the 15-year-old when she performs here tomorrow. She will be skating under tremendous pressure, knowing there can be no crowning medal moment in Beijing and facing the glare of competing nations who believe she and her country shouldn't be allowed to compete at all. The Olympic future of this teenager hangs in the balance. She has the potential to achieve everything, but could end up with nothing. Debbie Edward, ITV News, Beijing. And finally tonight, from controversy in China to all American action. Last night's Super Bowl in California was a stunning showdown, uniting sports stars with entertainment royalty. And there was even some British royalty too, with Prince Harry and Princess Eugenie spotted in the stands. Here's our entertainment reporter, Rishi Davda. If you're looking to celebrate hip-hop at halftime, it doesn't get much better than hometown heroes Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. An all-star LA party, rapper 50 Cent flipped the script with his surprise performance. Mary J. Blige added a little sparkle to the show. Iconic tracks made way for new hits when Kendrick Lamar delivered a love letter to Los Angeles. <laughs> Only for Eminem to help fans lose themselves in the early 2000s. Rap royalty enjoyed by real royalty. Harry may have moved to California with his wife Meghan, but it was cousin Eugenie who secured the spot next to him in VIP. And they weren't the only A-listers. Well, what do you expect when you're a stone's throw from Hollywood? It is time for the Super Bowl! The actual game was almost as exciting as the entertainment, a late touchdown helping the LA Rams beat the Cincinnati Bengals. Winners get a Super Bowl ring, but one Rams player made sure his girlfriend didn't miss out on getting a diamond on her finger. Rishi Davda, ITV News. And that's it for now. Tom's here with news at 10 from me and all the team. Bye-bye.